Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Johan, and today we're going to implement a very simplified version of a unique pointer and try to answer some questions about empty objects along the way. So we'll start with this simple class. It holds a pointer to some type T, and it has a constructor that takes a pointer that it owns, and a destructor that calls delete on the pointer. So this works uh, on pointers allocated with new, but maybe we want to use uh, a pointer that we can't call delete on, for example, a file pointer. Uh, so for a file pointer, we would like to call close in the destructor instead of delete. So we need some way to let the user customize the behavior on destruction. And to do that, we can use what's known as a policy-based design. So we add another template parameter, D. So this will be our policy class, which uh, holds the behavior we want. And uh, it will be a function object. And it's known as a deleter. So we will store the deleter uh, as a member variable. And inside the destructor, uh, if the pointer is not null, we will call the deleter passing our pointer. Uh, so now it works with any pointer, and you can customize the behavior on destruction. Uh, and as you can see, we're also defaulting the template argument to default delete. And default delete is our default destruction policy, which will call delete on the pointer. So if the user doesn't provide a custom deleter, uh, this one will be used by default. So what's the size of our unique pointer here? Uh, it has a pointer member, which will be eight bytes, on a, assuming a 64-bit system. And it also has this deleter object. But uh, the deleter is just a stateless object, so it shouldn't take up any space, right? Um, well, <laughs> all major compilers, they will print 16 here. Uh, so why is that? Well, the standard says that unless it's a bit field, a most derived object shall have a non-zero size and shall occupy one or more bytes of storage. So even an empty object uh, has to have a non-zero size. So we know it will be at least the size of a pointer plus one. And most impl implementations will use one byte for an empty object. Uh, so it will be eight bytes for the pointer plus one byte for the empty object plus seven bytes of padding to align it on a eight byte boundary. So that's a total of 16 bytes. So why is the size of an empty class not zero? it's to ensure that every object has a unique memory address. So if we allocate two empty objects on the stack, they will never have end up at the same address. But we don't want this extra memory overhead for our stateless deleter. So is there anything we can do about that? Let's look at the standard again. Um, so the standard also says that base class sub-objects may have a zero size. And this is known as the empty base class optimization. So if we have a struct x that holds an integer, instead of storing the empty objects as a member, we derive from it. And now the compiler can optimize out the size of the empty object. So the size of x will be the size of an integer. So how can we use this optimization in our unique pointer? Well, uh, I'm going to show you a technique used by most standard library implementations, and it's known as a compressed pair. And a compressed pair, it's similar to a standard pair, but it inherits from its elements instead of storing them as members. Uh, and that's to take advantage of the empty base class, empty base class optimization. So here's a simple implementation of a compressed pair. It has 
two template parameters, uh, T1 and T2. And as you can see, T2 is stored as a member, but we privately inherit from T1 to take advantage of uh, empty base class optimization. Uh, so if T1 is an empty object, it can be, the size can be optimized out. Uh, it also has a constructor to construct the pair and uh, two functions to get the first and the second element of the pair. And if we add that to our class, uh, so we have the compressed pair and the first template argument would be the deleter because that is the object that might be empty. And the second one is the pointer. Uh, so this does what we want. It will compress the size of the class to a single pointer. But as you can see, the code has become uh, much more complex because we have to call pair.first and pair.second everywhere. And we also have to remember which, which is the first element of the pair and which one is the second. In C++20, we have another way to achieve this, and it's an attribute called no unique address. And the standard says that it specifies that a non-static data member is a potentially overlapping sub-object, and that the non-static data member can share the address of another non-static data member. So what does that mean? It means that if we mark the deleter with the attribute no unique address, if the deleter is empty, it can share the same address as the pointer member. So the size will be optimized out. And now we're back to a more readable code again. Um, so a note about no unique address. It's, it's a bit weird attribute because uh, it has ABI breaking impact um, because it changes the class layout. So unfortunately, it's ignored by MSVC, even in C++20. And that's because they didn't want to break ABI across MSVC toolset versions. So if that's not a problem for you, you can use the namespaced version that is provided, which is MSVC, no unique address. I want to show you another example to give you an idea when some other places where you can use this. So here's a hash map example. It has a, has a bunch of uh, template parameters. A hash, which is how to hash the keys. A predicate, which is how to compare the keys. And an allocator, which is how, how to allocate memory for the key value pairs. And uh, these three, they could potentially be empty objects. And if they all are, they could share the same address as the bucket pointer here. So the size would just be the size of a bucket pointer. So the takeaways from this talk is uh, even empty classes have a non-zero size. And the base class sub-objects may have a zero size. And we can use empty base class optimization and no unique address to avoid occupying any additional storage for stateless members. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? Uh, for the compressed pair, can you just inherit both of the types and you don't need to care about which one is? Yeah, so, so I tried to make just a very simplified example here, but um, this has some problems, like if you have, um, if T1 here was a final class, for example, you can't inherit from final. Uh, so a real implementation would, you would need some specialization and say, use a concept to say, is, this, is T1 empty and not final, uh, inherit from T1? And you can have, if T2 is empty and not final, inherit from it. And, in, uh, and inherit from both, if you want. Uh, so Boost has an implementation of compressed pair uh, that you can look at if you want. Do you know if there's a 
compile try from SVC to force it to recognize the standard attributes, or do you still have to use a like, define or something to expand it to the MSVC version? So the question is, is there a flag for MSVC to recognize the new unique, no unique address? And no, it's not. You have to use uh, if defined uh, to do it, yeah. Thanks a lot for the awesome. Thank you.